time would be 40 seconds left. Yeah, well, <laughs> you could have asked that tomorrow. <laughs> when we're in the last time. Are you going to use the microphone? No. Okay. You want, you want I, to, I'd switch it off, yeah. They didn't switch. I, well, yeah. They said something that will just be a bit weird if I wanted to pass. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll take this and then I'll. Uh, there you go. That's where I've done it. So, welcome. So, welcome, everyone. Uh, Lord Taylor, Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to. Um, uh, a talk from the Sustainable Earth Institute, or under the auspices of the Sustainable Earth Institute. I'm Ian Stewart, I'm director of the SEI, and the SEI is this uh, a kind of uh, organisation in geo-environmental biological sciences, uh, but drawing in terms of sustainability-related research from right across the university, from, from health, humanities, business, etc. And we're putting on a number of talks that have a, a kind of local theme, but also have uh, much further uh, wider implications. Um, before I start, some domestics. Um, if there's a fire, run. Um, there's one there and there's one there. I'll probably go in that way. If you're nearer to that, we'll go that way. Uh, smoking, um, best not to. Um, and phones, if you could put them on silent, you might want to tweet or something like that, but uh, you can have them off. Um, and in terms of introducing our speaker, I'm going to pass over to someone who knows far more about it than I do. I'm going to pass over, pass over to Professor John Shaw. Thanks, Ian. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to those of you who come to our, our regular sessions here that we do through Geography and the Sustainable Earth Institute. And also, uh, we'd like to thank our uh, support from the Southwest Smart Applications Limited, who's a company that's based here in the university, and it's very nice and generous of them to, to carry on supporting these sessions. So, um, you'll be aware if you've been to the session before, we've had the chief architect behind uh, HS2, we had the managing director of Great Western Railway, and now we've got another very distinguished speaker, a very familiar face to those of us who have lived down here in the southwest for a long time, a uh, Liberal Democrat MP for um, Truro and St. Austell until 2010 when he stood down from that position and has since been in the House of Lords. He's been very influential working on um, housing and, and planning matters, been uh, advising both the, the Labour government and then the coalition government and uh, the, the current government as well. And his most recent work has been to do with uh, the, what he's going to talk about this evening, which is uh, garden villages. So without any further ado, as a geographer myself, I'm very much looking forward to hearing about this. So Matthew, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to use uh, uh, the speaker system, I'm not going to have a lot of slides, so you're going to have to put up with me and my voice, uh, which hopefully is not going to give away, uh, give away during the course of the evening. And I've been thinking quite hard about how I want to uh, organise uh, uh, my thoughts uh, uh, tonight, and uh, I, I kind of want to give a bit of uh, historical context to where we are now, but I want to start by uh, talking about what's up there, uh, the housing crisis, because it's really important, I think, first to, to establish why uh, I've become uh, somewhat obsessed with this subject since back in 2007, the then Prime Minister asked me to do a review uh, of rural uh, housing uh, and planning, and that that project I found really interesting. Uh, a lot of it was uh, about uh, changes around smaller communities and villages uh, to give them the opportunity to be more sustainable. And uh, some of the suggestions I made informed subsequent uh, quite major policy changes. Um, my view was that uh, the sustainability of rural communities was actually being hampered by a view that you couldn't change them. And, and that actually change was a necessary thing. And the change should be measured about whether it either maintained or improved the sustainability of communities. So I saw it as, as linear and that sustainability was not only about the environment, it was about social and economic sustainability as well. And that uh, thought, that, that idea of sustainability wasn't a, something that I came up with uniquely. I kind of, it, it, was, it was there, it was a developing thought, uh, but that, uh, very importantly inform the National Planning Policy Framework, which takes that notion of sustainable uh, development uh, behind it. I also uh, observed the way in which a lot of villages were cha changing from communities that were very resistant to change to ones where a generation of people were very aware that their children couldn't afford to live there anymore, that the people who worked in the pub and the shop and the farm were not able to live there anymore. And as those people were more and more excluded by the high cost of housing, that put the school at risk and the shop at risk. And 
because these communities were so immediately aware of the issue, they were actually starting to say, well, we would like some affordable homes. We would like that, but, but they had ideas about the form they would come in. Uh, very often, they might be a community land trust. They might have a landowner that would bring a particular form of land. They weren't resistant to change. They understood the problem when it switched from being things imposed on them uh, to things where they could actually take control of it. And that informed what's now known as neighborhood planning. But the bit that I became most interested in was the issue of how you resolve the housing need that we were facing in ways that didn't destroy the best of the community, uh, the place uh, that we love. And not only that, but how we overcame the political resistance in not these small villages, which I've just described how we could approach it, but in the larger communities to delivering the housing that we needed. Because as soon as you got into larger settlements, into the market towns, people might still be aware of the housing problem, but they weren't able to articulate that in the form of saying, well, we'd like our housing here or there. They felt that housing was imposed on them. And what they increasingly saw in villages and towns mm -hmm. and, and cities around the country was growth of uh, uh, estates that were bland, uh, unattractive, uh, and impacted enormously on their sense of what this historic community is. And I was particularly looking here at the historic market towns, places that we're very familiar with in this part of the country. I, I often talk about Truro, you could talk about Launceston, you could talk about Bodmin, where you've got a very clear historic settlement, and then you've got these, this, what I describe as donutting, circling these communities with endless estates. And every time the debate was had and people opposed the development and they didn't want it, and then they got the very kind of development they didn't want, and then the capital came back and said, well, actually, we need another estate. <laughs> and then it's another estate. So each one was fought as if it was the last one, but actually there was always another one uh, behind it. And I became really interested in this issue. Why, we, why was it like that? Was there a different way of doing it? Was there the equivalent, if you like, of working with the community to solve the problem uh, and, uh, and, and to deliver the house we need? But to understand why that's such a difficult issue and why I became so obsessed with it, I just want to throw some statistics uh, at you. And statistics, you know, they tend to be written up on the wall. They're not written up on the wall here because I think it's really important that I try and get them into your mind and into your, into your memory. So uh, this is why we have a, a problem. If you think about the period up to the Second World War, we had big growth in population. We had very, very big numbers of houses being delivered in the multiple hundreds of thousands uh, every year. It was being delivered by the private sector, it was spec build, and it went all the way back to the Georgians. And, and you'd have streets where, where the party wars were built by the Georgians, and then you went along and chose your frontage and what your rooms were. Uh, later on, uh, you had the same thing with Victorian and Wardian uh, spec build estates, um, where you were in direct competition with others, and they were being built in very large numbers, not always in brilliant quality, but what they did compete on uh, was space and quality of design, uh, the brickwork might not have been great, but the, but the housing was actually very much tailored to, to the demand uh, and, and uh, the needs. But what people increasingly started, as you saw wealth increasing and mobility increasing, was what was described as the urban sprawl. So you got the sprawl out of, of the urban uh, centres, and for us in this part of the country, you also started to see the coastwide sprawl, uh, the bungalows uh, along the pretty bits uh, of, of coast. Where people would, and people were reacting to that, and they were saying that this isn't this isn't working. This isn't good planning. This isn't uh, uh, this is destroying things that that we like. And so by the 1940s, uh, well, actually uh, earlier than that, you started to see people talking about fantastic placemaking. That's when you saw the original garden cities ideas being brought forward by people like Ebenezer Howe, mainly to address in that case the idea that people shouldn't live in the urban slums, that you shouldn't have the polluting factory next to the home. And he started to set out things that led to Letchworth and, and Garden Cities. And I'll come back to that idea later. Post-war, you had a much more government-led uh, process. You had appearance of the slums. You had uh, uh, the result of the bombing. You needed large numbers of homes. You had a big population boom. You had the, uh, the baby boom that I was born uh, part of. And some very, very important deals were made that I want you to hang on to before I give you those statistics I was talking about. And, and I see it like this. On the one hand, what we did was we started to control the way development happened. We started to say, 
the, in fact, the right to develop your land was taken away from you, it was nationalized, you had to get permission uh, uh, to build. But particularly what we were doing was trying to um, protect places. And then the de and the best way of putting that is we were, we were reacting to the NIMBYs. We were saying enough is enough. London's growing too much, Birmingham's growing too much, these places are growing too much, and they created the Green Belt. And the Green Belt was to, was to stop that sprawl, say, we're going to have an edge to uh, that uh, development. Uh, the initial intention was that people should be able to freely explore the Green Belt. It was actually a parkland, in effect, that would be around the city. That never happened. We never got the right to, to roam on that land to enjoy it, uh, but we did protect it uh, from development. But it was a very narrow belt. And beyond that, there would be new settlements uh, to deliver the housing that we needed during this period of very rapid growth. You've got Milton Keynes and you had the other uh, new towns. And we again were building very large numbers. This was no longer the private sector primarily delivering it. This was local authorities delivering it. Milton Keynes, all the early housing was actually council housing. And you saw people moving out from the slum areas, from the bombed out areas into new communities that were designed and were very, very popular. Uh, but, but actually you could kind of take a stake and decision to, we're going to move people here. Now, uh, bear with me, because what then happened is some really interesting stuff, and that interesting stuff has changed uh, everything that's happened uh, since. And the interesting stuff was uh, that uh, the population growth stopped. And the numbers of houses we had were basically in balance uh, with the need. And there were a number of reasons for that. Big decline in the number of babies being born. People weren't, particularly there wasn't the big growth you see now in, in how long people live. Uh, and alongside it, we also got an increase in uh, interest in the environment. Actually, it's why you saw cancer house sales. So you see all tenure and a bit of urban renewal issues coming up but we no longer needed to build. And some key decisions were therefore taken. The new town program was abandoned. Uh, big plans uh, around Warrington and so on that were already in place, land already acquired, it just stopped there. No new towns since, uh, since the early 19, uh, uh, beginning of the 1970s. Uh, but it was because we didn't need uh, the homes. And the projections around 1980 were that at this point in time, where we're living now, you would be seeing a very rapid decline in population. You'd actually have surplus homes. Be, the, we, we would have more homes than we needed. We'd be talking about demolition uh, of places that were effectively being uh, abandoned. And because we weren't going to need a lot more homes, we didn't need the new towns, but we could also do something else. We could massively enlarge the green belt. So you saw a huge enlargement of the Greenbelt area. It really became something else than it had originally been intended. It was no longer to stop the sprawl out from the city, because that was, could be done through a small containment. It was actually almost an environmental designation. It's not, it's not about environmental qualities, but it became like it. So the Greenbelt area in the country now, as a result of that, and frankly, it was free politics. It was very popular. There was no cost, because we didn't need more homes. Uh, the area of Greenbelt in the country now is more than the area of built development in England. In, uh, in, in Surrey, there, is more, uh, there are more golf courses than there is area of built uh, development. Uh, but it was all very free because we didn't need more homes. We got enough homes. But what then happened was the very opposite of what those projections, those demographic projections said. And that brings us to these statistics. So here are the statistics. You need to know when people say to you, I don't believe that we need more homes built. Number one, last year there were more babies born than in any year since 1971. It's a massive explosion in uh, birth rates. It's been going on now for around 15 years uh, or so. And when we talk about the homes that we will need over the next 20 years, and people talk about very large numbers in the next 20 years, then I hear often people say, well, how do they know? Well, the truth is, this isn't a projection of birth rate. This is the children who've already been born. This is my three kids uh, that we're talking about. Uh, uh, they're nine, eight, and four. 20 years' time, they'll be looking for accommodation of their own. We know that those numbers are there. We know that birth rate has accelerated, and we know that birth rate is continuing to accelerate. But we're not projecting it forward. We're simply saying we know that those children have been born. 
But what we are projecting for is something else, which is all of us in this room can expect to live much longer than our parents did. And the way to express, to understand that, is just how much we are seeing an acceleration in the number of older people because we're living uh, longer. So the number of over 85s will double between 2010 and 2030. So in 20 years, for those children who are being born today, the number of over 85s will double and those, 80, those people over 85 will typically live in their own home for most of that period of their, their extended uh, life. But it's not just the over 85s. You might think, well, you know, at the very end of our, our, our life, maybe we're living a bit longer. Let's take a, a, an age group where there's many, many more of us, and that's the over 65s. The number of over 65s in this country will double between 2010 and 2050. In a period of just 40 years, twice as many over 65s. Now, the over 65s, the over 85s groups I'm talking about, you're all alive now. All alive now just as those children will be moving in uh, to population during that period of time and growing up and starting to want homes of their own are already alive too. Now you can add to that migration internally from the declining economies towards the booming economies of the south. You can talk about uh, the migration in uh, from other countries as well. But actually the big driver on this is age and babies. And uh, we see this directly impacting on uh, where people are living. And two things are happening very, very fast there. The first is children staying at home when they ought to be leaving. Uh, so the group of in the age 20 to 40, 750,000 more of them are living at home age 20 to 40 than they were uh, 15 or so years ago. But that age group actually predates the baby boom. So there's been no increase in the number of 20 to 40 year olds, but there's been 750,000 more of them living at home with their parents. And when you ask the parents, do they want their kids living at home? They say no. <laughs> and when you ask the kids, do you want to be living at home with your parents? They say no. Why are they doing it? Because if you're not building enough homes and you've got an increase in the population and the demographics, and this is mainly driven by, uh, by people living older at this stage, with pre-baby boom, uh, of course the people who are excluded from the housing are those with no capital, because those who have capital push up the price of the limited number of homes. They go to the people who can afford them, and the people who are most likely to be excluded in that are young people who haven't got capital, they haven't got the deposit uh, for, for the mortgage on the ever more uh, uh, costly home. So there you have it, and what do we think we have <coughs> under-provided during that period of time? Well, we think it's in excess of a million homes and we've got 750,000 more young people living at home with their parents. We have the <coughs> evidence before our eyes of, uh, of, of the problem. So we've massively expanded the green belt. We've withdrawn from the new town programs. We're no longer creating new settlements. We've got this massive demand uh, forced through by increasing numbers of people uh, who need a home. And we see a direct consequence, which is house prices rocketing up because those with the most money can afford it. Uh, and actually the decline in interest rates meant they could afford more monthly and that just pushed up the house prices and we see more and more young people unable uh, to afford a home in their own right. So that's the crisis and it is a crisis because of the, the numbers that I've described and that is before we see this cohort of many, many more young people coming through the schools now, and you're probably aware of the difficulty of getting uh, your children into local schools in many parts of the country. Those people, as they grow up, are going to add to this problem, just as we are actually accelerating away uh, the increase in age. And incidentally, the latest projections underestimate what's actually happening in practice on both the baby boom and on uh, the old age and on the migration. So all of the things they're predicting in terms of how many homes we need, we're actually under predicting by what's happening on the ground. What do we think we need? We think we need about 250,000 homes a year to keep still with this, but to do the backlog, those 750,000 kids at home, we probably need to add another 50,000 a year homes to start to eat into that backlog over the next 20 years. So we need somewhere between 250, 300,000 homes a year. What are we delivering? Uh, well, last year about 140,000 homes. The year before that, about 112,000 homes. 
In the peak year, before the recession in 2008, uh, the maximum number we delivered was about 180,000. There are some uh, different statistics on that. You see some that suggest 200,000, but it's somewhere in that range. So even when we had the most booming economy, we were well behind uh, what happened. Why? Well, because uh, we, in my view, have forgotten the rules under which we originally set up planning and green belt and environmental protections, where there was a very explicit deal. We're going to protect places from sprawl. We're going to pr protect the more uh, sensitive environmental areas. We're going to, if you like, do something for the NIMBY and for good planning, but we are going to create new settlements, urban uh, extensions, garden cities, garden suburbs. We are going to plan for great new places, but that bit was abandoned. And something really interesting happened instead, and now I'll show you a, a slide. Oh, I hate slides, really, but anyway, let's do it. What happened was instead of doing new places, despite the fact that we said the planning system was about preventing sprawl, we actually started to say something else, which is we want to have sequential development. Little pockets of development that we will do despite the fact that people don't really want it, because we'll just do the next 200 houses, or the next 300 houses, or the next 400 houses. And it's all around the historic settlements. They're slightly kind of crammed together. Uh, there's Truro or whatever you have, Plymouth and the surrounding villages, and you can absolutely predict where that development will take uh, place. It will take place in these orange areas uh, because we will sequentially uh, develop. That has a very direct impact in a number of respects. There's a whole lot of pound signs up there. Because we're under-supplying the land, we kn and we know where the development's going to take place, and we know that if you've got the field on the edge of town, that's the one sooner or later they're going to come to, and then a year later they're going to come to the one uh, beyond that. We create enormous land values. So to get the land, you have to spend a lot of money. So what house builders do is they compete with each other for the next field along, and they press that case to the council. The people who buy that bit of land have therefore spent an absolute fortune on it. So what do they have to do to get their money back? They have to build really small homes <coughs> as densely as possible in very large numbers. A lot of people say, well, we, what we need to do is increase density. When I did the uh, review back in 2008 uh, and was looking at this, the government at that point had high density targets. They've been trying to ramp up density precisely because they were not building enough homes. What it was actually doing was wrapping up the price and therefore wrapping up the density. We were actually building at twice the density of the government target that was itself twice the density that we had been been building, uh, building at. Extraordinary figure. By uh, this stage now, where we are today, in our country, one of the wealthiest in, in the world, because we're squeezing the houses in to very limited amounts of land onto here, what we're actually building is smaller homes on average than we were in the 1920s. We're building the smallest homes anywhere in Europe, other than Romania and Italy, where most building is apartments, and yet we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And uh, we're actually, uh, by 2008, we were building 48% of everything we built was an apartment. And it's still, well, it's declined a bit, it's still around 40% of everything we build is a flat apartment. Does anyone in this room have an idea of how many people want to live in a flat? Yes? 12%. 12%. The actual figure is 2% of the population want to live in a flat. Half of what we're building is the very thing that people don't want to live in. You then say to people, well, what do you want to live in? And they're very explicit about what they want to live in. It's pretty much exactly what you imagine. It's a little house with a garden, not too big, but not too small, in a nice community, within easy distance of a school and shops and a pub, which has a real sense of community. What they describe is commonly known as a neighborhood or a village. But what we build is anything but that, because these prices, because we're releasing too little land and forcing up the price, won't have a school, usually doesn't have a shop, very, very unlikely to have a pub, because it's not viable to deliver any of those things, given the prices of the la on, that you're paying uh, on the land. So what you get is those estates. 
They're the very estate that people don't want. But they're built here. And what, of course, here means is that the existing households who bought the wonderful house on the edge of Truro, near the lovely view, get development in the one field that they really value. The field where they aspire to walk their dog, even if they don't actually get to walk their dog. The field that actually provides uh, the, uh, the, the flood plain, the water runoff for the city, so you get increasing problems with urban danger. Uh, drainage. The field which is guaranteed to be most expensive so you can't have any of the facilities. And this is done <coughs> in the name of protecting the environment, which it doesn't because it creates urban deserts. But it also is in the name of sustainability because the logic for this was, well, this is really connected to the town centre. Here are the services. The schools are here, the work's here, the town centre's here. But the problem is that the growth of the place means that these aren't well connected at all. These people don't walk to school or walk to the pub or walk to the shop because the pub is over here, the school is over here, and the shop is over here, and the workplaces are over here. So what you actually see, and we all experience, is massive congestion in the old built environment that can't take this with everybody driving in and out of the estates uh, on the edge. And you see the council landed with having to pay for the new school and pay for the GP surgery <coughs> but not knowing how to pay for it because the landowner has just got themselves an island near Bermuda and a helicopter <laughs> as a result of selling this land uh, in Sussex, a plot of land <coughs> outside a nice community in Sussex average price of a plot in parts of Sussex is now £500,000. That's not an acre or a hectare, that's a plot before you put a single brick, brick uh, on it. No wonder you can't put a pub there. No wonder you're trying to cram more and more in uh, really densely. We say it's about sustainability, but it's the very opposite of that. It drives a lack of uh, sustainability and ugly communities. But every time one of these is built, there's massive opposition. They say we're going to get a horrible estate. The developer says, no, 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 it'll be all lovely. And they build it, and it's the horrible estate you're predicting. And therefore, of course, when you say we've got a problem with housing, we've got to give somewhere for our kids, they say, but what you're building is absolutely disgusting. We don't want that. And you'll notice what we've done is sketch out here something that's remarkably like the green belt, doesn't it? Only now it's not the green belt, it's the desert that we're creating of these sequential estates. And each battle that's fought on them predicated on the idea that it's the last one. Now, when people defend this approach, what people often say is, but we have to do this because we're an overcrowded island. And it's just we just can't afford to build something, a new village like that, because we haven't got the space for it. We need to build at high densities or we'll be concreting over the countryside. So here I come to a couple more statistics, and I promise there aren't very many. I really do think you can hold on to them. England is 9% developed. And let's just think about that for a moment. So that means England is 91% not developed. 91% of England is green fields. There's a great little um, thought process you can go through as a result of Google. Bring Milton Keynes up on a map in Google, and people will think, oh, it's, it's huge new development, sprawling, uh, sprawling concrete for those who don't like it, fantastic concrete cows for those who do. Uh, it was designed and guarded the city principal, so if you go quite close, there's lots of greenery. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but it's a big place, isn't it? Then just come out on the Google map. And as you come out from it, what you find is it becomes a tiny white dot in a sea of green. 91% of England is still green fields. But then you say, well, actually, the place where you've got the demand, the place where people can't afford a home is more limited than that. <coughs> and here in the southwest, there's big demand. But most of all, the demand is in the southeast. And it's true. 
that's where we need to build the most number of homes, that's where houses are most uh, pricey by and large, it's where the biggest problem is, and frankly it's also where most of the resistance to development is, because they don't want this to happen around their beautiful southeastern lovely market towns. If you ask people how much of the southeast is developed outside London, the average answer is 45%. 45% is the average answer. And if you ask people how much would have to be built on to give people the homes that they need to live in, they'll say between 20 and 50, 25 and 50%. I.e. they think the whole thing's going to be built over. The actual figure for the South East, which is the most densely developed part of England, is 12.2% is developed. Turn that around, in other words, very nearly 88%, over 87% is still green fields even in the southeast. A very large amount of it is green belt. <coughs> now let's take an, a little deeper look at that 9% or well that 12.2%. 9% in England, 12.2% in the southeast. Of that, half is parks and gardens. Half of it is parks and gardens. Only a few percent is homes. Quite a lot of it is roads. Um, quite a lot of its factories, uh, the biggest part is homes. In England as a whole, less than 4.5% could be described as concrete. So when Kate Barker did her review of housing back in the 80s and said there needs to be 3 million homes, and you can remember what a reaction there was, God, they're going to concrete over the whole country. 3 million homes to meet the needs I've been talking about, the real needs, real children born today who will be leaving those homes later, real people like you who are going to be living unexpectedly long. She did a little intellectual exercise of, okay, supposing we built all those three million homes in the southeast, supposing we built all of them in the southeast, what would that add to the 12.2%? And the actual answer at the rates of density that were being built at the time that she did that review was it would add 0.75% to the built area of the southeast. You'd go from 12.2% to 12.95%. You still, still have more than 87% of the southeast green fields. And yet, in the name of we've got an overcrowded island with not enough place to build, we're building half what we build nearly is flats, though 2% of the population wants to live in one. We're building highly dense estates with tiny gardens, if any garden at all, uh, which then creates all sorts of urban drainage issues, which means that you don't create the biodiversity of gardens and parks, because of course the fields here have got no biodiversity at all, because of mono <coughs> agriculture. Uh, but if you turn them into parks and gardens, you get massive uh, increases in biodiversity. Uh, but you're building all of that stuff out in the name of there isn't enough space uh, to build. But look at that board. That board, what? Add it up together, it's maybe 20% we've built on there, something like that. That's twice what the, the South East is. There's loads and loads of space to build. So, all of this leads me to then the Garden Villages. Let's take ourselves out of this and start to think how we can do things differently. Given everything that I've said to you, the first thing we know is there's lots of space to build. The second thing we know is, if you say you're only going to build sequentially on the edge of town, you build in the very place that people most value as green space. It's their view. It's the gateway to their historic settlement. It's the thing that makes Truro feel like Truro and not spill up with sprawling estates up every hill and, and, over, uh, and over the brow. Um, we know that if you do that, Land speculators will know where the value of the land is, so the land then captures the value, which means you then price out the quality of the housing, you price out the garden, you price out the park, you make it impossible to deliver the school and the pub and the shop uh, because it becomes too expensive uh, to do that. You then end up with massive resistance to development because nobody wants that built in the places that they love and care about most. And we do it all under the misapprehension that there's a shortage of land in this country, and for some people the misapprehension 
that there isn't, there isn't a need, which we know that there is. Uh, and we do it in the argument that somehow it is sustainable to build on the edge of town because people will walk to the school and the pub and, and the workplace, but we know that they won't because these estates are too disconnected from those very services. And that's why, of course, during the term time, you can't get across town, but when the school holidays are on, uh, you can. Because there's all these people shifting their children from one side of the town to the other and not walking at all. And the irony of that is, the one thing you can't change in the historic community is its inability to take that level of traffic. Whereas, if you drive down the road, we might be worried about emissions today that those cars shouldn't be emitting in a few years' time anyway. So, we're doing it in the wrong place, in a way that is guaranteed to be unpopular, is guaranteed to lead to undersupply of housing because people resist development, and which isn't sustainable in the first place. So why don't we do this instead? So we've got our historic community. We've got that green area around it that we can now protect. Mini green belts, if you like, not for London, but for the historic settlements we like. If we want to build something, because it's a great <coughs> proposal, we can. But the landowners here can't assume that they'll get development. So if they don't offer something fantastic, they didn't get permission. But what we can do is decide, we've got some villages around, let's add a village here, or let's add a village here. What can this allow us to do? Well, let's go back to the New Towns Act. What the New Towns Act did in an area of big government was take decisions to build big places. But now let's take the world as it is today. Anyone know how far the average person moves when they move? What do you think? Ten miles. Ten miles. Ten miles. It's eight miles. It's eight miles. About right. So, actually, creating a big Milton Keynes and assuming everyone's going to go there isn't going to work in the world as it is today. You can't decamp London in the way that you used to. But what you need is to create places for the children of the people who live here in their lovely old houses where they can afford to live. What the New Towns Act did was allow you not to pay hundreds of thousands of pounds just for a plot before you built a single brick. It allowed you to buy this at agricultural values. In the modern world, what my proposal says as well, we won't force people to sell at the last penny of current agricultural value. We'll give them a bit of an uplift. It's going to take that guy's farm. Let's pay him twice what it's worth. He can buy twice as good a farm somewhere else, or probably actually it's his exit into retirement from the farm uh, uh, in practice anyway. What we do by capturing, the, uh, capturing that agricultural value is now suddenly we can transform what we deliver. It's not that you couldn't do a garden suburb here, but this is going to cost you too much. Catch this at values that are realistic and which they would sell for anyway and give them a bit of uplift. And now suddenly you can do something extraordinary. You can create a development <coughs> body that is charged with doing these three things. Number one, creating and planning a fantastic place. So the planning stops being about development control, stop being about when you can have this little estate next and we're going to fight that one and we're going to do this one on appeal. You can actually start to create wonderful places again. It's what most planners went into training on planning for, but then they get, it gets knocked out of them because it's not what we do. But it is what they intended when they introduced the Planning Acts and the Green Belt, for assuming that you'd be creating new places. What that body does is it just it acquires the land and then it uses its ability to sell plots at a reasonable level, not an extortionate level, the difference in value allows you to build the school, the GP surgery. Your land is cheap, so there's nothing to stop you having good sized gardens because effectively they come for almost no cost. There's nothing to stop you having fantastic parks because they come at very little cost. You can put in place uh, workplaces, uh, you can put in place your duck pond, uh, you can put in place a cafe and shops that don't have to show Tesco type rents because you can make it part of your social infrastructure. So you can create the things that we all enjoy in historic 
villages and towns. A run of shops that includes local employment. And that brings me to another slide. So, Eensham is a little market town, oh, well, market, it's a little village uh, outside Oxford. Pick, uh, effectively at random, the guy who was doing these slides happens to know it, so that's why uh, he picked it. Um, a number of places around uh, Oxford, places like Kidlington and Whitney and Abingdon have grown quite fast because Oxford is itself protected by, by a green belt, but there is massive demand for homes and what's happened is various communities around Oxford have grown because they haven't created new settlements. But Eensham has been not much development. If you went there, you'd recognise it from uh, 20, 30 years ago. There, had, there are some new estates, there is some new building, but nothing very great. Total number of houses, 2,050. Population, 4,650. The extraordinary thing is because there is an historic built environment, there are little shops and premises that are cheaply available to rent. The result of that is the number of businesses in Incham, in a population of 2,050 homes, 4,650 people, is over 250 businesses. There's a little hairdresser's, there's a flower shop, there's a grocer's, there's a general store, there's a school, of course, uh, all of those things. Uh, you can call it an enterprise community. By capturing, if you created a new village here or here or here, by capturing the value, you can put in a, a social infrastructure investment, all of those things. You can create a fantastic place to live. There are over 100 community clubs in that small community and various spaces uh, for them to meet. So now we have the ability to create a supplement uh, that will meet exactly the description of the places that people want to live. By giving local authorities the choice of acquiring land that way, you also depress the value of the land around the existing supplements. So you have choices about where you create these great places because you can do it as an urban extension as well without having lost all the value uh, to the landowner, because mm. they have to compete with this option. You hear a lot about garden cities. What I've been saying is don't make them too big. Because people don't move more than about eight miles, actually, you don't need places of 30, 40, 50,000. You don't need to build Milton Keynes. And Milton Keynes is really hard to build, because the infrastructure costs of doing that is enormous. You need to be on the main line railway. You need a dual carriageway to service it. You need a massive town centre before you've built it. But most of all, because people only move eight miles, it takes forever. Milton Keynes, even decanting people out of London, never built more than 1,800 homes in a year. So a decision to do a place of 80,000 homes doesn't touch the need for the 250 to 300,000 a year homes that we need. You need dozens of them. But these little places, can deliver at 500 units a year quite easily, particularly if the value of the homes and the cost of the homes is quite low because your site plot costs aren't high because you've captured the value of the land, even after making a great place. And we know that because just up the road at Exeter, they went down this route with Cranbrook. The problem with it is that they paid a lot for the land, so they haven't been able to do the great placemaking because the captures. But even then, even then, it is building out at 500 units a year because people can't afford homes in Exeter. So it is offering young families without a lot of capital the opportunity to build a home, and it did build a school right at the start. So the most essential piece of infrastructure for young families uh, uh, was delivered. But the lack of capture of the land value has reduced the quality of the placemaking that you can deliver at 500 units. So just three villages of 1,700 homes uh, will give you a primary school, 5,000 homes will give you a secondary school, broadly speaking, and a good range of shops and facilities if you can do that through this infrastructure investment. They can be building at 500 each, so just three small communities being built in a Devon or Cornwall would be building at the rate that a Milton Keynes a decision to do a city of 80,000 would be building a year anyway. And when you built one village, you can choose to build another. But these villages, being small, have another advantage, which is it's not they don't need a big connection. That road or this road would only be single carriageway for these size of community. Most of the movements can be internalised.
the school and the shop and the pub and the workplaces can be within that community as, as well. And traditional communities actually internalize a lot of their movements. Modern estates don't because they don't have all those facilities and workplaces built into them. So actually the movements will be minimized, but we know they'll come into town for the cinema and the Marks and Spencers special and the, and the better clothes shops. But we don't mind them driving down this road because in a few years' time we hope they're going to be in electric cars that aren't polluting anything. What we do want them is to stop here and not drive into town. So instead of building an estate, we can build a park and ride and we can stop them driving into town with fantastic public transport uh, alternatives. So we minimise the problem that we don't want and can't solve the congestion. We internalise as much as we can there. We create a great place to live. People can live in the homes that they actually want. And that master builder makes plots available to small builders, self-build, commission build, new entrants. So we're not in the hands of the big house builders who don't want to build many houses a year because they want to maintain house prices. What we want to do is encourage competitive build out on quality and price but within a really well planned master plan, making sure that the quality is there. And suddenly, you've got a market that looks like all the other markets we understand, where people are trying to sell you the better product at a better price, and not say, take this <coughs> at this huge price, knowing that it will sell because there's a shortage. So we turn it from a rationed market into a functioning supply against people's needs. We do it in a really well-planned way, which was the original intention of planning. So can garden villages solve the problem? Absolutely, they can't solve the problem by themselves. But they can dramatically change the housing market. They can dramatically change the land market. They can free up land at a price that allows you to deliver quality. You can create places that function as the original Garden City vision uh, was, but actually all the places that we like and know function already. We can deliver homes at much lower cost to people's needs, and we can overcome the barriers of the lock that the big house builders have by supplying ready-made plots to small builders, self-build, commission build. And I'll finish with this. If we don't go down this route, we absolutely know that we will continue to undersupply because the politics means that development will be resisted. We absolutely know that development that takes place will continue to be as smaller homes than those places in Europe, half the size of the average Danish home, at much higher prices. We absolutely know that the people without capital, young people, will be increasingly priced out of a home, and God knows, much as I love my kids, I don't want them to walk home when they're 40, and I absolutely know they don't want to be at home uh, when they're 40. Piece of don't think so. They keep telling me they want to live at home forever, but I don't think they, they know what they're talking about. Um, we absolutely know that the development that's happening at the moment <coughs> won't be sustainable, because it will make worse the problems of sustainability and we absolutely know that that works because we've seen it work before. All we're doing is remembering why planning was introduced in the first place, to protect historic communities, to stop the sprawl, to make sure that we were delivering enough homes, whether you call them homes fit for heroes or homes fit for your kids. The new way of doing it will not just change the way that you do the garden village, but will force the landowners who've assumed that they're going to make all that money to compete by providing parks and workplaces and schools instead of just buying their helicopter to get them to their island near uh, Bermuda. And in doing so, we won't make more concrete on the land than we would otherwise, we'll just put it in places that makes more sense. In a country that can easily afford to house the next generation, but has failed now 
for nearly 20 years to do so. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Matthew. That was a fascinating, compelling talk, uh, an argument extremely well structured and, uh, and put across. And now, of course, you'll no doubt be burning to ask lots of questions. So uh, I'll, I've got the, the privilege of chairing this question session. My glamorous assistant over here who will perhaps has the rolling, mic uh, the rolling microphone. So who would like to, uh, to kick off with a question? Gentleman at the back, and then, and then Jeff, and the gentleman there. Matthew, thank you very much for your very cogent argument. Um, I'm Ashley of the Green Cities Foundation. And the uh, question I'd like to ask is, what is the political will to make this happen? And how will you overcome nimbyism? OK, well, um, when I um, present this to government, I say uh, it's time to start listening to the nimbys. They're not all wrong. Because what we basically say to nimbys at the moment is we have to have lots more housing, so you're going to have to have it stuck in a place that you don't want. And you're going to, it's going to be a really dense state because we've got to make it really dense because we can't otherwise fit in the number of homes that we want. And actually, what they're saying is, but that feels really important to me. That's the gateway to Truro. That's the historic setting of uh, this village that's um, going to impact on the value of my house. They're not wrong about that. They haven't bought the view, but they've certainly paid for the view. Um, what this does is start to answer actually quite a lot of those NIMBY issues, which is says, look, yeah, okay, we actually think, we understand what you're saying. We, you want your village to stay the village that you love and you grew up in or you bought into. Uh, that historic market town, yes, of course it can't stay exactly as it was. It will change and it will evolve, but tacking on unthought through dense, poor quality estates because the value has been sucked away by the landowners uh, isn't, uh, isn't right. So the key thing about this is instead of having this terrible argument where the people who don't want the estate are told that they've got to have it because we need more houses, but <coughs> they're not actually saying necessarily we don't want more houses, they're just saying they're not here, actually they're right. That's what planning started. Before planning, we did this. That was exactly what happened. That's, that's why planning was brought in to stop that. To say either what's built should be great and well planned and properly done, or let's create a new settlement and protect, uh, protect your back garden, your backyard. So the key thing about this politically, and I, one of the reasons, and I'm passionate about this because I think it's created much better places, I actually also think that it's an answer to the political conundrum, is essentially what you're saying is we're going to need these homes, we're going to need these facilities, let's put it over the hill <coughs> and create a new fantastic place rather than wrecking the old uh, fantastic place. Let's capture the value so we can do it properly. And uh, people say to me that it's too crowded, but I've told you it's not too crowded to do that. And there's a wonderful thing that... Um, uh, somebody here said to me not so long ago, which is there's a book about uh, uh, the lost villages of England. Because in the Industrial Revolution, the villages were abandoned. Actually, there's plenty of places in Cornwall uh, which, which lost settlements, although settlements are just a, a tiny fraction of what was, uh, uh, was there before. It's not as if there weren't more communities in England. It's not as if there's some kind of rigid thing that where the villages and towns are now is the only place that villages and towns can ever be. And also, just so that we can uh, make this as clear as I can, it is simply uh, nonsense to say that somehow the field on the edge of the town is the least valuable one environmentally. How did we ever come to that conclusion? Surely the field on the edge of the town is one of the most environmentally precious places. It's the <coughs> bit that gives the town breath. It's the bit that gives it its setting. It's the place that people love and most want to go and walk their dog on. What we actually ought to do is what the Green Belt was originally intended to do, is let people walk their dogs on it. Let's take some of those fields that have just got monoculture sheep. And so actually, let's make, create a park there. And the only reason we don't create the equivalent of Hampstead, uh, Hampstead Heath now 
is of course those bits of land are worth multiple millions, whereas if they're a little bit further out, they're worth a couple of thousand pounds an acre. Why are they worth multiple millions? Because you know that's going to get developed sooner or later. So we've created this completely <coughs> distorted market. Yes, the politics will become much, much easier if we start to listen a little bit more to what people say, the kind of homes they want, the kind of places that they want, and the places that they want to protect. Yeah, thanks a lot for a <clears throat> very interesting and stimulating talk. I mean, I, I kind of buy your argument, but it's still made within the wider context of, of people wanting their own houses for their gardens, as you've highlighted. So I want to come back to, I think, what is the most interesting figure that you mentioned in your talk, which is 2% only of people who are willing to live in a flat in the UK. And if you compare that in a European-wide context, I mean, countries like Italy, France, Germany, over half of the population live in flats. There are issues. But it's culturally much more acceptable in these countries to actually aspire to live in a flat. And we all know that apartments are a much more effective way to build for large populations. And these countries in Europe are less densely populated than the UK. So isn't that the key issue here? It's to address, for historical reasons, the very high demand that people have in every layer of society for individual homes with individual gardens. I and mean, isn't that the key issue? Because if you then remove that incentive from your argument, a lot of what you're saying, although it makes perfect sense and is better, I think, than the current situation, I think you're quite convincing on that. But if you remove that need, doesn't that completely change the planning uh, implications for house building in the UK? I think, um, uh, well, so first of all, one of the interesting uh, side effects of this is at the moment, because you do effectively allow sequential development to take place, the urban redevelopment is second to, 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 to these extensions. So actually, ironically, you make uh, renewal of existing urban centres uh, more difficult, uh, and people are more reluctant to build on the genuine brownfield sites. A lot of brownfield sites are actually very green. Uh, they once were a factory, but they no longer. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the real urban renewal that you need, if you take away the ability to build around the edge of Churro, you make the sites within Churro more valuable. So actually, some of those more dense styles of development <coughs> you would get in, in the city centres become more likely to happen rather than, uh, than less. <laughs> At the same time, you're also providing these these garden samples. So uh, I, I don't, in, in any way, suggest that it, you, you you give up on uh, some of those uh, 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 urban renewal and, and 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 those will often be very dense, um, and people will choose to buy into that city lifestyle, uh, if you like. And I'm actually very keen on some of the things that have been done to try and encourage really high quality private rented sector, um, particularly for young professionals. So at the moment. Uh, will we'll actually, because they can't afford to buy, what you get is young professional sharing little houses and flats that used to be occupied by um, young parents, young families with kids. And they price them out because the several young professionals are learning can pay a lot more than people, a, a couple with one and a half uh, uh, an income. Uh, one working full time, one working part time. Right? So uh, in London, particularly, it's young families that are being most priced out um, by that. So yes, there's a, there's a role for it. But I would really challenge you <coughs> to ask yourself, on what grounds would we say to people, well, you shouldn't be living in houses with gardens, you should be living in apartments. We're not short of land. We're not short of income to pay for this. Uh, is it actually an unreasonable thing that people uh, should live in places that they aspire to. As I said, they're very clear about what they, where they would like to live. There's a period of their life, and so when they, as I said, young professionals actually will say that they, they, they like city living, they're very happy to live in flats, fairly obvious why, they haven't got kids, they're not worried about turning them out into the garden. Uh, they're pretty happy to go off to the park if they do want a bit of space because they can freely travel and they've got lots of money, uh, so they don't actually spend much time in the apartment. Uh, once you're a mum with a kid, and you're spending perhaps half your time at home, 
Uh, and particularly if you like uh, Vicky and I, you've got little boys who go completely insane if you can't turn them out into the garden. Uh, what it is between girls and boys on that, I have no idea, but uh, uh, the girls will sit at the table doing the, the, doing the art. Uh, all my men and women are the same stuff went out when we had babies, because uh, uh, you see it all. But if, I mean, if you've got kids, you want a garden. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you want to live in a community that you can walk around and it has a, a cafe with a pub and you can buy a newspaper and you can feed the ducks for your kids and, and have a coffee with uh, other mom from the school when you drop your kid off. These these aren't things that are unreasonable. <coughs> we're not short of space, we're not short of wealth. And actually, if you look at uh, other countries, um, it's true, some countries have higher levels of apartment <coughs> living, uh, but there is a mix of reasons for that, some historic, uh, some are about built environment. Um, but actually, uh, you see countries that are much more densely uh, not related than ours, uh, building houses and with gardens. Um, and uh, there's just no reason not to do it. I've told you about sustainability grounds. I'm someone who really, really worries about biodiversity. And uh, it's simply a fact. Some of the richest biodiversity in our country is gardens and parks. The lowest level of biodiversity in our country is monoculture. Why not give gardens and parks? Why protect the monoculture green field that's that little bit out of town at the cost of giving people the places they want to live in? Um, I'm Tim Jones, I'm chairman of Devon and Cornwall Business Council. Um, Matthew, uh, firstly, uh, a public thank you for the hugely important work you've done uh, on exposing the fragility of affordable housing um, nationally um, and of creating uh, some really interesting opportunities as to how we can improve that. So um, thank you for that. Uh, two, two points I just want to uh, explore with you, um, which we've slightly touched on, but I'm not quite sure we've got to the root yet. Um, the anomaly on the demand side of this um, it is interesting. Um, the national statistic about urban living uh, has now gone to over 50% in the UK. The prediction is that um, people uh, across the globe will live um, in cities um, to an extent 75% of the world population by 2050. Now that's either a symptom of uh, a failure to deliver the right kind of product or it's a symptom of lifestyle choices. Um, but I guess we need to just examine that issue about where that supply uh, demand point lies. Is, is there really a demand for people to live um, in rural dwellings, rural villages, um, the sort of settlements you're describing? So I think that's the first point that's interesting to challenge. But substantively, I think the other point where there is a huge danger of underestimating the problem is uh, the first question that was raised, the NIMBY question. Now, the government let the genie out the bottle by creating um, community engagement, neighbourhood planning. Um, you know better than anyone, Matthew, um, what, what happens at the sharp end of this. Um, site villages, um, small villages in Cornwall, uh, trying to deliver uh, two affordable uh, new dwellings for uh, local farmers um, inspires 24 objectives to turn up, three with their planning and barristers. Um, this, the extent of the problem about community involvement, community nimbyism, um, and how precious the countryside has become as a political argument, I think is it just too difficult for the government to put that genie back in the bottle again. I mean, that, I think that is the challenge. Okay. Um, just, just on that first one, um, uh, let's be a little bit careful with the urbanisation issue, because what you act, and of course what you see is, in every industrial revolution, you see the, the sucking in from the countryside uh, into the city, city of populations, because that's where the wealth is. Uh, and what tends to happen is the people who are living effectively subsistence lives in the countryside get a chance of, not huge amounts of money, but, but more money as they move into to the city, and there's a big drive there. Uh, but we also have um, uh, very often um, um, approaches to development which are about, when people are quite poor, building the equivalents of the, of the slum tenements that were built uh, in this country during the Industrial uh, uh, Revolution as people poured into the cities to fill in, in, in the factories. And that's what you see happening in, in the India. And actually, you see that with a lot of development uh, that takes place in places like China as well. 
But interestingly, those countries are starting to look increasingly about how you create better quality. Exactly what happened with us as you moved into the 20th century, more and more emphasis on good urban planning. Starts with things like sewerage and water systems. Uh, it, you then saw the Victorian <coughs> parks, and you're starting to see that, that those demands as well for space, and, and but you also start to see the requirements on much better quality uh, of housing. You start to let's plan this properly, let's do it properly. So I don't think the demands are necessarily that different around uh, the world. It just depends what stage in the process uh, that you are. Uh, the second thing is, I'm not necessarily saying all of these are tiny places. I mean, these could be five, ten thousand homes. We're talking in Cornish terms, the size of a number of the, the larger towns. But at the moment, what we're doing is spreading development around each of these towns and creating problems in these places with servicing in terms of schools and hospitals and movement uh, uh, around them. Uh, two or three settlements in Cornwall <coughs> can provide the great majority of the housing that Cornwall is being asked to provide over the next 20 years in two or three places, and they would be pinpricks on the map once you've taken the decision to them. A new Bodmin off the A30 somewhere would not be noticeable if it was over the hill. You forget it was even there unless you lived there. Uh, so uh, they are deliverable. And that brings me to the answer to the second point. If every settlement in Cornwall of any size is under this threat constantly, if every time a development takes place it's treated as great battle, as if that was the last development that would ever take place, and then when it happens, there's another one, and then there's another one, unsurprisingly, you get massive opposition. Because every community is being impacted by this development. And not only that, but every councillor is being. So all of your councillors, their politics is not about delivering houses to what is still a relatively small proportion of the population who need a house built. It's actually about protecting the interests of the great majority of the population who already have a home and like the place they're in and don't want to see change there. And yet, what we do is absolutely maximise the number of people who are negatively impacted by development, particularly in rural communities. This, is, this isn't such an issue in, in London. There's other issues in, in London, the big conversations, except around the edge. But for places like ours, which are full of relatively small settlements, the impact of that kind of development is absolutely massive. And they also think that there's huge amounts of housing being delivered. So when you say to them there's not enough housing, of course they think there is, because the places you're putting it are the most visible places for people. So you maximize the political opposition from the population, and you maximize the political opposition from councillors because they deal in votes, and you're maximizing the number of votes that don't want uh, development and are resistant to it. If you just decide to do instead one new settlement out here, of course it's going to be physically controversial. Anyone who thinks there'll be no opposition to that, the CPRE will say that it's building in the countryside, although the CPRE incidentally have been really supportive of this idea. I address the National AGM and CPRE. Uh, so I mean, <coughs> there is, they have a difference of opinion about how many you need, <laughs> but they don't have a difference of opinion that if you're going to build them, do it right. They've been really supportive uh, of this. But you will get from the CPR, you may get a local CPR group who's, who's, who's against it. You will certainly get some people who live in some old farmhouses here who are absolutely beside themselves. And in my proposals, I say, well, let's compensate them. They bought a lovely old farmhouse in the countryside. They don't want a development built around them. Uh, currently, you buy all the land around them and you strand them in the middle of it. And for years, they're going to see development around them. It's the very thing they didn't want. So let's give them a bit of compensation. Say so either buy a nicer house somewhere else, or at least or stay here and get your mortgage paid off. In terms of the cost of the settlement, it's negligible. But at the moment, we treat them really badly. So that's part of uh, the package. So they will still resist, probably, because they love the place. But at the moment, we treat them really badly. They're not wrong in being so resistant when they hire a barrister, it's because they have paid for that view, even if they haven't, mm -hmm. as I said, bought it. They have every reason to fight it all the way. But most importantly, if you do the one new settlement, or the two new settlements, the three new settlements in Cornwall, the great majority of people aren't actually being damaged by that. The great majority of councillors haven't got people complaining about it. 
And you've got the chance, once you've shown how you do it, to show that these aren't just housing estates. We can actually create something that is a really great place to live. We used to do that. It seems to me the most appalling failure of imagination to think that it's not possible to create great places anymore. The people who built Lemon Street in Truro didn't think we can't build on this, this open hillside above the port. They thought we're going to create this fantastic Georgian avenue as, an, as, the, as the people coming from Falmouth down into uh, what was then the town of uh, Truro. It was something they were proud of delivering, but they weren't paying £500,000 a pop. That's how you overcome it. But do you think, do I think that there'll be no opposition? Absolutely not. Why should there be no opposition? Of course there'll be different opinions. But what we do at the moment is make it virtually impossible to deliver, except, frankly, over people's dead bodies. But what actually happens is people get the development they didn't want. When councils approve it, they've ignored the community almost always. When what actually lots of councils do is they actually let it go to appeal <coughs> so that it's not their fault it's been imposed uh, by the government. It's lowest common denominator politics. They are promised great development, which then on viability arguments, all the nice stuff is stripped out. So of course, if we get massive opposition, we can improve on that. But at the very least, if we do build against opposition, because we need to, at least we can think, well, we've built something nice and good and sustainable, and that is what people want and will be great for the families who live there. What we actually think at the moment, let's be honest, when the councillors approve that new estate, they don't think they're creating something fantastic most of the time. They think they're doing the numbers because they have to, and it's the least worst option. Ladies and gentlemen, time marches on. Um, and so, the, the gentleman in the green uh, jumper had a question for us, so if you could switch seat to him first, when you have a wine, that's afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or maybe it's just to give you a glass of wine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, can I just say, uh, just, just, just to say a little plug? Of course. Two little plugs, sorry. Number one, uh, if you're interested in any of this, there is a policy exchange document, Garden Villages, that sets this all out much more coherently than I probably did tonight. Uh, uh, number two, um, uh, this is really live with government. This isn't stuff that is getting pushed back. This is something that uh, uh, I'm hoping to really influence change on. Uh, so when that happens, if it does, get involved in the debate because um, I'm sure it will be a debate. <laughs> and, uh, and number three, and I shouldn't say this, but I will, uh, if you've got a question you didn't get to ask it, and you don't get to ask it for a cup of wine, um, you will, through the, uh, the Google, be able to find ways of getting hold of me. Just email me, I'll be, I will reply. Uh, there aren't so many of you on the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, but thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you very much.
Thank you. 